Let's pray together, shall we? Father God, we come to you today, and our hearts are grateful. Our hearts are, while heavy, still filled with joy, recognizing that for those without Christ, there is no hope, but for those of us who are in Christ have the ultimate hope. We're grateful for the hope of eternal life through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We're grateful, Lord, that this is not the end, but only the beginning for those of us that are in Christ. And may we celebrate that truth today, Father. Help us, Lord, even though there are hearts now that are grieving because of tremendous loss, uh, hearts grieving here, hearts that are grieving in Florida, hearts literally grieving around the world, uh, Lord, we ask for your grace and your peace. And Lord, for us here today, I pray that you would open our hearts, that our focus would be on the truth of the Word of God. That we would understand that you have taken great care throughout the centuries to put together a book for us. That you have written your mind down for us. And we, in turn, are wise to spend time in that book and to learn your mind and to obey your truth. God, help us not to be hearers only, but to be doers of your word. May we take what we hear today and may we employ it in our lives each and every day. I pray, Father, that your spirit would move among us even now. That you would fill every believer with your spirit and give us ears to hear. That we might be purposed to be obedient followers of Jesus Christ. And for those that are here today that do not know you, I'm so grateful that they're here. And I pray that your spirit would be moving among them as well, bringing conviction and bringing a a challenge to trust Jesus Christ as their only hope for eternal life. May they be born again even today. We pray for those 16 young people that are at church right now, down in Florida with Larry and Donna. We pray that your spirit would move in their hearts so that they would turn from their sin. And that they would trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. God, what a privilege, what an honor, what a joy it is for us to be together today. We are the church. And we praise God that you, you are our Father. And it's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Busy, 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 busy. That's what we hear all the time. That's the, that's the cry of our age. We're busy, 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 busy. I am a total nerd. I have my, my planner here. In fact, Heather Gulgin was around here somewhere, was just mocking me for this. I don't know where you went, Heather. Uh, but she was saying, oh, look at all your colored pens are in order and all of that. Yes, I am proud of my planner. I am proud of this thing because nerds rule the world. Can I get an Amen. Yeah, that's right. But this is the cry of our age, folks. The cry of our age is that we're busy, busy, busy. I'm just so busy. Honestly, when I ask people how they're doing, the vast majority of the responses that I get are, I'm busy. I'm just so busy. And I don't doubt them. I really, I really don't. And, and, and I'm sure uh, they, they are legitimately busy. I, I don't doubt that. The question is, I think the question for all of us is this morning, busy doing what? Busy doing what? And the next question should be, should we be doing what we are so busy doing? I think that's a very legitimate question to ask of ourselves. Should we be busy doing what we are doing? These are questions that we as believers in Jesus Christ must grapple with. And like I said, I have my nerdy planner. I set my goals. I try to, ta- I try to carry out my tasks with faithfulness and with productivity. And no doubt you have a planner or a calendar or you're, you have a Google calendar or you're, you're, a, you're a, not a paper guy. Maybe you're a Google person. It doesn't matter. You have your tool that you use to keep yourself moving forward. 
uh, that, 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 uh, so that you can accomplish your tasks every day, every week, every month, every year, etc. But what about God's planner for you? What about God's planner for you? What about the calendar that the Lord has for you? Does your planner, does your, does your planner or calendar match up with God's calendar for you? Are they in sync with each other? Do they have the same agenda? Do you have the same agenda on your day that God might have for you? Have you ever even considered that as a possibility, that he's concerned about that? Listen, if we're going to be busy, perhaps we should be busy doing the things the Lord has on his planner for us, right? Maybe, maybe that's where we should at least start our focus. There are many, ladies and gentlemen, many tasks and projects that the Lord wants us to be doing And I'm excited to share two of them from the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Two responsibilities that I believe are so important that Paul saved them to the end of his letter. And that really leads into the main thought that I want to share with you this morning. You only have so much time, use it wisely. A very poignant point this morning, folks. You don't know how much time you have left. We're grieving this morning because of a loss. None of us are guaranteed the rest of this day or the rest of this week. You only have so much time. Use it wisely. So what are these two responsibilities? Well, one of them has to do with how you walk, and the other one has to do with how you talk. So let's take a look at the first one, and this this is the first point for the sermon Use your time wisely as you walk with unbelievers. Use your time wisely as you walk with unbelievers. Each day, every day, you and I walk among those who do not believe. In fact, in most cases, in most cases, we are surrounded more by unbelievers than we are by believers. They're either alive in Christ, the people that we are walking around, or they are the walking dead. C.S. Lewis identified this in his book, The Weight of Glory. I think it's a marvelous quote. He says, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. In other words, not significant. But it is immortals whom we joke with, we work with, we marry, we snub and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. That's a a profound thought. And Jesus tells us clearly that there are more unbelieving than believing. I just read this this morning in the Gospel of Luke, and I'll share it with you from Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And so, the Apostle Paul gives a clear admonition to those in Colossae and, consequently, us today on how we are to walk. Look at verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Of time. So we're to walk in wisdom towards those who are outside. So who are the outsiders? Those who have yet to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Those who, those who are not followers of Christ. And, and, and the challenge from Paul is, is that we believers ought to walk in wisdom around them. Well, that begs the question, what does a wise walk look like? Well, he answers the question in the second half of the verse, making the best use of the time. 
So a believer is to demonstrate wisdom to the unbelieving world by making the best use of his or her time. Well, what do you think Paul had in mind when he wrote this? Well, we get a clue from another letter that he wrote that sounds very similar. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, Paul writes these words. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of your time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So we see some similarities between these verses. Don't live your life in an unwise way. Be wise. Well, how? By, by using your time well. Why? Because the days are evil. In other words, we live in a sin-ravaged world. Use your time well. By not doing your will, by not doing the world's will, but doing the will of the Lord. In fact, Paul says it very strongly. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So what is the will of the Lord, especially in conjunction with Colossians 4 or 5? Both deal with God's will and how we're to use our time, especially especially Colossians 4 or 5, making the best use of our time. Now, Now, as I thought about this, I know this might sound a little bit silly, but as as Christians, we are agents of God, sent on an assignment. We're like special agents of God, like like Mission Impossible. And some of you are already doing it. Dun, 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 right? Right? You're, You're with me. So you picture yourself, you, you, you're, you're, you're getting out of bed in the morning, and, and you're hearing that dun, 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 dun. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to carefully live out your life in a wise way among outsiders. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. That's your mission. You're God's special agent. He wants you to live your life in a wise way. This is the mission that he has given you. And so because you and I are believers in Jesus Christ, if we are indeed believers in Jesus Christ, we choose to accept the mission. We choose to carefully live our lives in a wise way among those who are outside. But where are the instructions On the how. How how do we accomplish this? What does this even look like? Well, the first thing we should do is start by defining the word wise. That would be a great place to start. The word wise, Sophia, means insight, skill, uh, prudence, sound judgment, shrewdness. I define it this way. The skillful application of truthful knowledge. The skillful application application of truthful knowledge. Do you know who that sounds like? It sounds like God himself. And, and where do we get to see God in action? In the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. In fact, if you look in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says this, long ago, At many times and in many ways, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The Son of God, God the Son, is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of God's nature. So we see Sophia, we see wisdom in, in Jesus Christ himself. In fact, we can say that Jesus Christ is the very personification of wisdom. Not the world's wisdom, but the wisdom of God himself. Do you want to see what wisdom looks like with skin on? Look to Jesus Christ, and you'll see what wisdom looks like. Now, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, because this tells us what wisdom is. Paul writes these very, very poignant words. He says, For the word of cross is folly to those who are perishing, 
But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and is the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The wisdom of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, is the gospel of Christ. It's foolishness to the world. But you and I have the glorious privilege of taking this foolish message, the gospel, to the walking dead that walk among us. We have the honor of sharing this life-giving word of God that is foolishness to those who are dying, but to, to, to those, who are, those who have ears to hear, it is the sweetest sound one can ever hear. It is the sound of Jesus calling, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the reason that Jesus can say that his yoke is easy and his burden is light is because he carried that yoke and that burden to Calvary for you and hung on it, having his own soul tormented so you might find rest for yours. He bore the punishment that you and I so richly deserve, and he gave us rest. Isn't that beautiful? This is wisdom. It's beautiful, beautiful wisdom. It's the gospel. And for those of us who have submitted our lives to this profound truth, we now have the privilege to share it with those who are yet to come to faith in Christ. By the way, stop looking at it as such an impossibility. Oh, there are millions and billions of people who don't know Jesus Christ. It's hardly worth even trying. Baloney, one person at a time comes to faith in Jesus Christ. You have a responsibility for your circle of influence, and that's what you're supposed to do. And if we all took our responsibility very seriously, I think we might reach people for Jesus Christ on a global scale. So let's look at it that way. Let's not look at it as an impossible task because through God, all things are possible. This is the gospel. But you might be thinking, oh, Mark, God could never use me. He could never use me. I, I, don't, I, I have no Bible or seminary degree. I get all tongue-tied like a fool, like Moses way back in, in the book of Genesis. I, oh, I, I, there's, no, there's no way that God can use me. There are way better candidates out there that God can use other than me. Maybe that's what you're saying today. Well, I want to invite you to look at just a little bit farther down in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verses 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. And because of him, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God's not interested in you boasting, saying, look at how many people I led to Jesus Christ. You know why I'm in the ministry today? Because I'm a fool. 
And God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. For the reasons you think that God cannot use you for the communication of the gospel are the exact reasons why he can and he will. So, how do you walk in wisdom? Walk like Jesus. Walk like Jesus. How do you make the best use of your time? Be a fool for Christ. By sharing the wisest message ever given. The gospel. How then, Romans 10 asks, Paul asks, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Do me a favor. Look down at your feet. I'm serious. Look at your feet. Dennis is like, ew, I don't want to look at my feet. Paul commands us to walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of our time. So how beautiful are your feet? Are they carrying the foolish message of the gospel the way they should? And if they are, if your feet are doing that, your feet are absolutely stunning and gorgeous. They're beautiful. Listen, we only have so much time. We got to use it wisely, folks. And, and, and we need to be very wise in how we walk among unbelievers. But that leads us into the second point, and it's this. Use your words wisely because you only have so much time. Use your words wisely because you only have so much time. So Paul moves from the feet to the lips. And as the old saying goes, our walk must match our talk. So look at how, look at how Paul finishes this thought. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Ladies and gentlemen, our words, your words... Our words are powerful. They're powerful. And, and Solomon reminds his readers of this. He says in Proverbs 18.21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Isn't that something? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. If you move to James, in, in the book of James, James chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, James expounds on this concept. He says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. And set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and kind of bird and of reptile and sea creature can be tamed. It has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers... See that these things ought not to be so. And so Paul, with, with this admonishment in Colossians chapter 4, this last admonishment in his letter, instructs his, his readers in the church to use their mouths for good, right? To, to you, that's what he says, let your speech always be gracious. And now I just read from James 3.8 that no human being can tame the tongue because it's a restless evil full of deadly poison. And so Paul comes along and says quite the opposite, right? But please notice what James says. No human being can tame the tongue. But God can. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can change the speech of a redeemed man or woman to reflect the character and grace of God himself. 
My mouth does not function like it used to function before I was a believer in Jesus Christ. There was a lot of stuff that came out of this mouth that would make you blush today. And God changed that. There was a lot of gossip and slander. There was a lot of haughtiness and pride. And I still wrestle with that stuff. But God changes the tongue. And praise God for that. Only God can do this because only God can change the heart. And Jesus tells us clearly that whatever comes out of our mouth is a clear reflection of our heart. And so Paul can legitimately say to these Christians in Colossae, and to us as well here this morning, speak with graciousness. Ladies and gentlemen, that's an admonition for us, to speak with graciousness. Now certainly we're to do this for all people and with all people, but the context of this particular passage, Paul is referring to believers, how believers ought to speak to unbelievers. That's what's going on here in this passage. Uh, they, they ought to be, there ought to be a marked difference in how a believer speaks to the world versus an unbeliever speaking to the world or in the world. Grace. Isn't that a wonderful word? How many of you love grace? I always ask this question. Oh, man, not everybody loves grace. I, I, we all should love grace, right? What is grace? Grace is attractiveness. It's charm. It's wisdom. It's favor. It's care. It's help. It's kindness. And listen, this is how I picture Jesus talking with most people, not with the Pharisees. Uh, he, there's a few times in the scriptures we see when Jesus talks to the Pharisees, he pulls the gloves off and he lets them, gives them what for, right? You whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. I mean, he, he was not afraid to speak truth, right? But with most people, with most people, he spoke truth in love. He was, I think he was, he was charming. I think he was winsome. I think he was kind with his speech, I mean, take, for instance, the woman at the well in John 4. Why in the world would she continue to engage in a conversation with a Jewish rabbi unless he were gracious with his speech? He said some, if you read that, and that's a homework assignment, John 4, when you read that, he said some very hard things to her and about her. He knew that she was an adulter in an adulterous relationship, and he told her about it, and yet she wasn't offended to the point of where she left the conversation. I think that's fascinating. I don't think he was, I don't think he was looking down his nose at her and pointing his finger at her. I think he was speaking to her truthfully, but yet with grace. We don't have the benefit of hearing the intonation and the exchange between Jesus and this woman, but I'm willing to bet that even though he spoke very difficult and very challenging truths to this unbelieving woman, he did it winsomely and with grace. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me. We must speak truth to people. We must. Believers must speak truth to people. The unbeliever who remains unconverted will spend an eternity in hell. This is the raw, unadulterated, unmitigated truth. If you die and take your last breath today and you are not a believer in Christ, you will go straight to hell. That's what the Bible teaches. By the way, what does this truth do to your heart? Does it break it? Does this truth break your heart? Does it tear it up? Does it cause compassion to well up in your soul? That person with whom you've worked for the last five years who doesn't know Jesus will spend an eternity in hell unless they turn from their sin and turn to Jesus as their only hope for eternal life. Do you talk to them about this reality? More importantly, how do you talk to them about this reality? If we can learn anything from Paul and Jesus, it is we are always gracious in how we talk to people who need Jesus. But Paul doesn't stop with graciousness. Because graciousness in and of itself 
won't draw someone into a believing relationship or a saving relationship with, with Christ. Just being nice isn't going to save somebody, right? But if you throw a little salt in there, you might make them a little bit thirsty. I'm sure you've heard the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But there's another saying that goes along with that. I love that. I didn't draw that, by the way, but I just thought that was a perfect picture. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But you can put salt in their oats. Why in the world would you put salt in the oats of a horse? To make them thirsty so they drink. Friends, you need to put a little salt in your gracious speech to make people thirst for more. How do we do this? What does this even look like? Well, uh, first, there isn't one single way that we do it. There isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. That, that's what Paul is saying at the end of verse 6. Look, look again at Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Do you see that each person there? Bob is different than Sally, and Bill is different than Ralph. One approach may work well with one person and another with another person. My mother-in-law, Trudy, is her, she told me her secret question that she asks is, do you have a church home? That's a great salty question to ask. It's a great question. Just, just do you have a church home? That's, that's good. Let me give you some other salty suggestions. J.A. Meters, he's a pastor from Tomball, Texas, uh, he gives this suggestion. He says, if you struggle to get the conversation with your friends or neighbors or barber or whomever rolling towards the gospel, there's one question that you can ask that will get you there quickly. What do you think Jesus is doing right now? That'll get him thinking. What do you think Jesus is doing right now? He goes on to say that he, uh, he recently asked this question of a restaurant worker or server at a restaurant, and this particular server was struck. What do you mean? What is he doing? He's dead, she said. He's not alive. And, 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 she, and the pastor says, she picked up on my grammar, and all of a sudden the red carpet rolled out for me to tell her that Jesus is not dead. He folded up his grave clothes, walked out alive, and is still alive today, and desires for her to be saved. Boom! And then he gives her a list of, of scriptures that I'm going to share with you right now. Jesus is today inviting sinners to faith in him. The one who hears our good news in evangelism hears not our voice, but the voice of Jesus. Jesus also is holding the universe together with his words. You know, we're worried about, oh, is this planet going to make it very long? This planet will make it as long as Jesus holds it together. That's all we need to worry about. Because he's holding it together with his word. In him all things hold together. Jesus is sitting at the Father's right hand. According to Hebrews 8.1, Jesus is interceding for his people, Romans 8.34. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant with God, Hebrews 9.15. Jesus is powerfully working among his church, 2 Corinthians 3.13. And Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming back. And if it were today, that would be just fine with me. It would be just fine with me. Remember, the power of that two, those two little letters is because Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, is alive. He is alive. J. Warner Wallace gives, some example, or gives another question, uh, an important question. He, he says this is the best question that you can ask. What do you think happens after we die? It's a great question. He says, he says there's three reasons why that this particular question is so powerful. He says, number one, it's diagnostic. You will learn their worldview right away when you ask someone, what do you think happens after we die? It's diagnostic. You're going to learn a lot very quickly. He says it's disarming. He goes on to say this, questions about the afterlife are often easier to ask than questions about God, even though the discussion of one inevitably leads to the discussion of another. Many people have 
given uh, thought to issues of life and death and earth and, and all of these things, but haven't seriously considered the existence of God. And he goes on to say, you'll be surprised how many people are willing to talk about this particular question. And then thirdly, he says, it's directed. So it's diagnostic, it's disarming, and it's directed. He says the question, what do you think happens after we die or when we die, is directed at the most important offer there is, the gospel of Jesus Christ, forgiveness and eternal life. That's where we drive them, folks, when we ask a question like that. We're not just taking a survey We're trying to lead them to Jesus. There's hundreds and hundreds of more ideas online. I just Googled uh, questions to engage people in evangelism. If you just Google that, there's tons of stuff uh, that you can do some research for yourself. 28 years ago, this October, 28 years ago, this October, someone asked me a question that is forever burned in my memory. And I'm forever grateful for this question and the follow-through. And the question is, would you like to do a Bible study with me? That's the question. Would you like to do a Bible study with me? It was a simple question that God used to propel me into his word with someone who knew the word. And it was that question that set me on the path to redemption. So for me, it was that question. For someone else, it might be another question. Each person's different. One size doesn't fit all. But that question to me was gracious, but it had enough salt in it to make me thirst for more. And God used it. And folks, I'm standing here today because of it. You have no idea. You have no idea what God might do with someone that you talk to 28 years later. You have no idea. So don't sit there and say, God can't use me. God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, folks. He's not interested in anything else than your obedience. And he will use you in ways, if you obey him, he will use you in ways that will blow your mind. You only have so many words you will speak over the course of your life. And when I think about that, it's convicting. I've said some really foolish and dumb things, and and I'm glad that I don't have a recording of all of them. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm recorded enough as it is, but I don't have a recording of all of those, but it's embarrassing when I even think about it. But let me challenge you with this. Why not purpose doing what Paul says in this passage when it comes to dealing with the lost, when it comes to dealing with your friend or your neighbor or your family member, whoever God places in your path, maybe even a server at a restaurant, why not let your speech always be gracious? Listen, I've been to, pe- I've been to restaurants with Christians who have been rude and mean and nasty to the servers. And then we talk about, you know, spiritual things. And then they're just curt and rude and mean to the ser- God forbid. That is a God-ordained opportunity. And get one of those cards I gave you, and you pull that card out, and hey, Trudy, do you have a church home? Or what do you think about God? Or what do you think happens after we die? And see what God does with it. Open it up. You have no idea. But we've got to be gracious to everyone that comes across our path. Who in the world do we think we are when we're rude to somebody? When we're rude to somebody, we're placing ourselves over them, aren't we? God forbid. So let your speech always be gracious. And put a little salt in it so they get thirsty for more. That you may know how you ought to answer each person. Why don't you try that this week? I'm sure you can find some time throughout this week to obey the Lord and talk to someone about Jesus. I bet bet you can. And and I want to encourage you to pray each day for God to direct you to that person who needs to hear about Jesus, and then do it. Absolutely do it. Start up a gracious conversation with them, and then ask them a salty question, and see where God takes it. 
Like I said, if, if you're scared to death, get one of the cards that are out on our table out there. These little cards are amazing, the true life cards. You can just hand it to them, shaking, scared to death, and, and uh, go, 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 go to that website, and then run for your life. And God may just use that foolish action to lead that person to Jesus Christ. You can do this by God's grace. Listen, we only have so much time. We have to use it wisely. And we have to use it wisely according to God's terms, not our terms. God defines what wisdom is. We don't define what wisdom is. So use your time wisely as you walk with unbelievers. And you use your words wisely as you talk to unbelievers. Because we only have so much time. You know, I think, folks, I think this is very, very significant. We've journeyed. For those of you that have been here for a while, we've journeyed through Paul's letters to, or Paul's letter to Colossae. And, and we've learned some substantial theological truths as we've gone through this letter. We, we've also learned about uh, some heresies that Paul was teaching them and challenging them on and that they were dealing with. And we've been challenged with the idea that Jesus Christ is the supreme ruler of the universe, of, of, of all creation. And now we come to the last two verses of admonition and command from the Apostle Paul. Now, there's more to come, and there's two more sermons, so, so come back. But, but these are the last two commands, the, the last admonitions that we see from Paul in this letter. And after all the instruction that he's given us, after all of his teaching, the last thing he challenges this church with is how they walk and how they talk. I think that's substantial. I think that's fascinating. More specifically, that their walk and their talk are to be used to witness about Christ. This is the very best use of their time. Yes, folks, we're a busy people. We all have our nerdy day planners, right? We're, we have these things. Well, except Dennis. He's retired. Uh, his wife just tells him where to be, at, right? Is that right? Okay. Well, she's your... She's your day planner, right? So you have one, okay. We all have our planners. We all have these things. But remember, remember, if we're going to be a busy people, which we already are, perhaps we should be busy doing the things the Lord has in his planner for us. So in light of this, I ask you, what changes do you need to make to your planner so it agrees with God's planner for this week, to accomplish what, what God would have for you in the limited time that he has given you. My earnest prayer for you, for you that are a believer in Jesus Christ, for those of us that believe in Jesus Christ, my earnest prayer is that you make the best use of your time that he has entrusted to you. For those of you that do not know Jesus Christ, my earnest appeal to you is that you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and that you don't waste any more time waiting. The Bible is clear. Today is the day of salvation. Place your trust in Christ as your only hope of eternal life. If, you, if you're not quite sure how to answer that question, where do I go, or what happens after I die? If, 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 you're, not, if you're not sure about that answer, I want you to leave here today sure about that answer. And I want you to come and talk to me about that or I'll get someone to help you with that if you don't like talking to me. That's fine. I just want you to be sure that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have a place with God in heaven for all of eternity. That would be the best use of your time today. Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege that it is that we have to come together and worship you. Lord, I pray for all of us. It's convicting to me to read this passage. And Lord, I want to walk in such a way that uses the time that you've given me 
in the best way possible. I want to talk with speech that is always gracious and seasoned with salt. I want to, I want to be thinking about people that, from an eternal perspective, like, like C.S. Lewis challenged us, that, that, that they're either they're immortal horrors or eternal splendors. God, help us to have an eternal perspective. Forgive us that we get so wrapped up in this world and we, and we, and we lose sight of the, the eternal that every one of us in this room will spend heaven, it will spend eternity in either heaven or eternal condemnation in hell. Oh God, help us to either praise you for that or to repent and become a follower of Jesus today. And it's in Christ's name we pray this. Amen.